Shabbat Shalom. I went to a family bat mitzvah last weekend in Toronto. Mazel tov, Emma, if you're watching. It was great, and I love seeing other synagogues, how they worship, what music they do, what liturgy they emphasize, what the gender roles are, everything. And the Torah chanting at this bat mitzvah was amazing. The rabbi did most of it, and he was a speed chanter. Every word of Torah was like a bullet exploding out of a rifle. And it was so fast, honestly, I was having trouble following it. And I don't mean to brag here, but I'm usually pretty good at that sort of thing. I can follow a Torah. About three aliot in, and I'm flipping through my Torah commentary, and I was completely lost. I was frustrated and kind of embarrassed. Like, I should probably be able to do that. I looked over at my husband's Torah commentary and I noticed something and then sigh of relief. My Torah commentary had three pages missing. <laughs> that explained a lot. They hadn't been ripped out, nothing untoward had happened to the book. It was a misprint from the beginning. The words were never there in the first place. My husband noticed it too, and we looked at each other, and I smiled and said, there's a sermon in this story. <laughs> what if the story of Exodus was never in the book of Exodus? What if the creation story of Adam and Eve was just never created? What if the desert was never Ba Midbar? What would it mean if pages of our text were never there? How would the Jewish people be different? How would we be different? Same with our lives. What would it mean if you had simply never met your spouse? What would your life be missing? Or what if you just never encountered your closest friend? What would be different? What would be absent? how would you be changed? Just like each human being we meet, no matter how impactful or forgettable they are, it all matters. Everything contributes something to our lives. I've been teaching religious school to sixth and seventh grade students, and they were complaining about some of their bat and bat mitzvah Torah portions, saying how the portions were very boring or very archaic, et cetera, et cetera, that they were technical and they were antiquated. Poor Leviticus, always getting insulted. Of course, the rabbis hold the opposite view. They insist that every chapter, every verse, every word, every jot and tittle of Torah is necessary. There are no accidents there. There is meaning in everything. And if you study any Talmud at all, it's hard not to be persuaded by the idea that every sacred word has purpose the rabbis perceive profound and expansive meaning from text. They're so insightful. Their thoughts are more than just meaning. Their ideas become wisdom. So as we continue to slog through the book of, Ex of no, Leviticus, I ask you, what would it be like if this week's Parsha just wasn't there, if it was missing from the beginning? Is it archaic? Or is there a lesson to be learned or an idea to be gleaned? Maybe a little bit of both can be true. The second verse of our Parsha says, when you enter the land that I assign to you, the land shall observe a Shabbat for Adonai. The land observes Shabbat. You can interpret it many ways. Maybe it's a call to environmentalism, let that land rest and restore itself, Stop taking from the land and respect it. Let it rest just like you need to. Maybe it's some kind of practical farming guide to help the land produce more. You must till it slightly less to glean more. I like the commentator Sforno's interpretation. He says that the commandment is not really about the land. It's about the farmer. He says that the farmer should stop farming for a while and instead start praying. You can see why this is up my alley. He says it's about starting to fulfill mitzvot, 
Start devoting yourself to God's work instead of your work. Not forever, not for every moment, but at least for Shabbat. Stop farming, stop looking down at the earth and look up, look around, notice. Notice the beauty of God's creation. Notice the blessings you've been given. Notice your own achievements and successes. Give the work a rest and look around. We are so lucky to be alive. I am thankful before you, God. You have put my soul in me. To me, that verse alone is worth it. That idea that rest must be cultivated just like the land is a jewel. If the page were ripped out or just never there, we would be a little bit more empty. There is another interpretation of the text that also speaks to me. Midrash Tanhuma teaches that if a column does not have a capital above and a pedestal below, it does not look beautiful. It's just a column. It's the relationship between a capital, a pedestal, and a pole that makes a column something important, something magnificent, something worth stopping and looking at. Rabbi Samuel ben Gedalia says that there is no section of Torah that does not have a capital above and a pedestal below. Words of Torah are always interwoven. They support each other. They impress upon each other. They interact and they make each other beautiful. Even when it's hard to tell, it's still happening. So too with our lives. Without the mundane, we couldn't experience the sacred. Without 364 days a year when it is not our birthday, that one day of celebration would be less joyous. Without the daily grind, vacation would lose its magic. Without the push of work, the pull of Shabbat would be diminished. Without the more technical parts of the Torah, the inspired sections might feel a little bit less divine. Sometimes it's hard to notice the meaning in our lives and certainly in our texts. My hope is that we take the advice of this week's Parsha and take a moment to rest, to let Shabbat do the work, and to be open to the possibility that to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. Shabbat Shalom.